Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Welcome to the second day of the OSN Skills Summit. We are thrilled you could join us today to continue our discussion on opening up the learning earning ecosystem. My name is Kelly Ryan Bailey. I am the host of Let's Talk About Skills BB, a podcast that highlights innovations in skills-based hiring and learning, a founding member of Equity Cities, a consultancy that enables regional coalitions to build equitable skills-based talent marketplaces, and the global skills evangelist at MZ Burning Glass, a labor market analytics firm. I am also honored to be a part of this small but mighty group of OSN founding members. OSN is a coalition of employers, education providers, military government agencies, technology organizations, and other stakeholders dedicated to advancing skills-based education and hiring. Our goals are to create the foundation to advance a more equitable labor market, empower learner workers to understand and communicate the value of their skills, talent, and experiences and to eliminate barriers to implementing skill-based education and hiring practices across industry sectors at scale. I'd like to thank Walmart Foundation for its continued support of the OSN, the OSN staff, as well as all of you. It is amazing to see how far we have come with all of your help. Yesterday, we started off the OSN Skills Summit strong with, an op with opening remarks from both Sarah DeMarc and Scott Pulsifer. Sarah described the work of OSN as building a community to link learners to the workforce, level the playing field for job seekers and expanding opportunity for all. Scott reminded us that skills provide a common language that transcend the various contexts an individual will transverse throughout their life and career and can tell the full story of our capabilities, achievements and experiences. And not to forget the memorable keynote by Secretary Raimondo, in which she states the gaps in our labor market are not just about gaining new skills. It's also about helping job applicants communicate the full range of their skills and experience to employers. And the plenary panel, a changing workforce and what it means for the international to local landscape, where Christy Means described the change management needed within Ralph Lauren as they transition to utilizing skills, where Rupert Ward reminded us to keep the learner earner at the focus of our work, where Marnie Baker Stein touched on the importance of finding cost-effective yet scalable methods, and where Leslie Hirsch shared the future of skills work in the state of New Jersey and the importance of not forgetting the wraparound services to help learner earners take advantage of opportunities. We had two amazing rounds of breakout session sessions as well. So for those of you that missed any of the day yesterday or want to view additional breakouts, those recordings are available within this platform and to OSN members. You can come and join OSN as a member at openskillsnetwork.org. You can also learn more about any of our presenters yesterday and today and access their contact information under the presenter bios. And we have an amazing day planned for you today as well. We're going to be kicking things off with another panel, followed by interactive breakouts and back to a final general session for review and to learn what's up next for the Open Skills Network. Don't forget that you can connect via the conversation corner, which you can join through the lobby and also join us on chat. I've got that open here and I'm going to be be active in asking questions. And lastly, we encourage you to share your learnings via social media using hashtag OSN Summit. If you tag me in Open Skills Network, we're going to reshare those. We would love to hear from you all. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. I'd like to introduce Andrew Teen, the VP of Education to Careers at Wiley. He is going to kick us off with a discussion on activating employers in a skills based marketplace. Andrew? Thank you, Kelly. Delighted to kick off day two after an amazing day one. Uh, Andrew Tian, VP of Education Careers at Wiley. You know, we're at this interesting intersection as a company across thousands of higher ed institutions, employers, and government, and um, have been focused really on not only how we connect, but create 
pathways to get learner workers into meaningful careers. And I think like OSN, the panelists today, and, and many of you who are attending, we see clearly that skills are the currency of mobility. Um, if we collectively create transparency through data, among, among many other things. And you know, the focus of today's session is on the employer because they play a critical role in the skills and workforce conversation. Who are they hiring? How do they assess backgrounds? How do they understand skills? You know, what kinds of jobs and beyond jobs, jobs um, and paths into opportunity? These are the, the fundamental questions I know we all care about. And talent practices are on the front lines in many ways. And especially some, what we've seen in the pandemic, the acceleration of skills-based hiring, renewed emphasis on equity, um, there is a, a lot of great activity out there. At the same time, you know, we know that skills um, is a, a complicated area, to say the least. We've got to have the infrastructure in place to make changes so that data is trackable and understandable, not only for the large employers, but also for the long tail of small and medium enterprises across our, our country. And that requires partnerships and collaboration and to facilitate the, these kinds of connections, especially um, as we think about training and programs that creates the, the pipeline, right? Um, a diverse, robust talent pipeline into our workforce. Um, Sean has done a lot with folks with military experience. I mean, there, there are a number of ways we uh, need to be thinking about this. And, you know, I was just <laughs> reflecting on a conversation that uh, we at Wiley had, we've been really fortunate to um, launch several coalitions, most recently with Upskill America and Digital Us, uh, an employer network focused on digital skills. And, you know, at the beginning of these conversations, you're kind of fighting through the morass to, um, you know, we have a, a clear collective mission, but then you get down into job roles and skill levels and it, it becomes uh, a little more complicated. But I, what I am, am excited about is that there's so much momentum that uh, we have on not only employers, but uh, institutions. And as we uh, face the infrastructure bill, hopefully on, on, on the government side. So we're here today to discuss the critical role of employers in this skills conversation. How are we going to link employers into the workforce system through work like OSN to allow workers to be recognized um, and have access to the opportunities that they want and, and jobs that lead to successful careers. And we have some terrific speakers who are going to tell us what's happening on the leading edge, um, who are also uniquely positioned to build and scale innovative initiatives that work. Sean Murphy is a senior manager on the opportunity team at walmart.org, where he supports Walmart's philanthropic efforts in developing the infrastructure needed to empower a skills-based workforce system. He's led Walmart's investments um, in some efforts that many of us know well from the Chamber's T3 network to OSN and among others before joining Walmart in 2019, a long track record of experience in regional workforce as well as uh, policy roles. We also have uh, Jason Tishko, vice president uh, for the Center of for Education and Workforce at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Jason is focused on advancing policies and programs that preserve our competitiveness and enhance the, the career readiness of youth and adult learners. Um, many of you know, know Jason through the TPM, Talent Pipeline Management Initiative, as well as the Jobs and Employment Data Exchange, uh, among many other initiatives. So you, you see sort of some of this uh, infrastructure conversation, um, which I know we're going to dive into. And of course, we have Debbie Hughes, director of the Markle Foundation. She is leading Markle's Rework America Alliance, which is working to help millions of unemployed, low-wage workers move into good jobs. In that role in particular, Debbie leads the alliance's national partnership efforts with uh, a focus on job insights and uh, employer initiatives. And just like our other panelists, it 
Debbie has been an active champion in the space for 15 plus years and most recently was at Walmart and the Business Higher Education Forum. So for today's panel, we're going to have uh, Sean, Jason, and Debbie start um, by opening up uh, and orienting us into their organization and a few of their key initiatives. Then we're gonna launch into moderated questions and Kelly will be on hand to um, help us make sure we get to some of your questions as well. So with that, um, Sean, do you wanna kick us off? Yeah, thank you, Andrew and, and fellow panelists. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great to be on this panel with you all and just wanna thank the OSN team as well. And I think we, a big shout out, Kelly already did this, but you know, Secretary Raimondo's remarks yesterday, I think are just so key to show the, the level of leadership that we have um, around this, this focus around skills in the workforce system. And, and just as I think about the, the work she's done previously, the legacy she's left in Rhode Island. So just really exciting to kind of build into today and the topics we're gonna be doing. Um, as you said, uh, my name is Sean Murphy. Uh, I have the privilege of representing Walmart today, a company um, focused not just on creating jobs, but building paths to support upward mobility uh, for our associates. Um, here in the U.S. and globally, and uh, this is, you know, really shown through action. I think many of you may have seen in, um, in the last few days that our announcements around educational benefits, um, really our, our, our efforts around training associates in our academies and on the job, um, the upward mobility opportunities that we have within Walmart, um, and then as well, our philanthropic commitments. Andrew, you mentioned a few um, that we um, have engaged in, in efforts around the opportunity um, pillar that I, I focus on. Um, and it's mostly what I wanna speak to today. Um, you know, since Walmart announced the original commitment to opportunity, a five year, $100 million commitment, um, which we have well surpassed, uh, we have been uh, support, uh, supporting and, and really partnering with countless organizations that are building innovative learning models, partnering on coalitions such as 110 and Business Roundtable, Multiple Pathways Initiative, Skill Up, um, Markle and the work that they're doing, of course, the Chamber um, and in the work there. And, and then, uh, uh, of course, we're, we're talking about OSN and, and the work they're leading. Um, all of which, as we know, are, are basing their work and skills. Um, we've been working, um, as you mentioned as well, just really thinking about the infrastructure. So from a philanthropic pers perspective, how do you support all of this infrastructure that is being built by so many partners? And I think the key in this that we want to be talking through is how do we make this interoperable? Um, and how do we really work across systems um, to, to enable that? And so. I'm excited to be here with, with my fellow panelists to talk about the topics today, talk about how employers um, are engaging or could be engaging. Um, and then just again, wanna thank the OSN team, WGU, and, and all that made this summit possible, and, and as well as those that prioritized attendance today. Um, appreciate you being here. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Andrew. Look forward to jump into questions here shortly. All right, thank you, Sean. Jason. Thank you, Andrew. Really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here today as part of the Skill Summit. Uh, the, the Chamber Foundation is a proud member of OSN and member of the steering committee, uh, and we are just grateful for the opportunity to uh, not only be part of this, but to make sure that the portfolio of work we're leading with our employer members uh, is really leveraging um, the work of this network, but also contributing uh, towards it. You know, in entering today's conversation, what I really wanted to do to kind of frame things up um, from the chamber's perspective is, you know, uh, we need to think about advancing or how we're gonna activate employers in the skill-based marketplace in the context of infrastructure. And, you know, we, 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 we could talk a big game about, you know, why skills are important, how to use skills, but if you don't have an enabling infrastructure to support that through, through an end-to-end -end workflow process, uh, we're not going to get very far. So th there's a lot of different moving pieces here. And what's great about networks like OSN and, and other networks like the T3 Innovation Network is we're trying to bring these pieces together. Uh, but one thing to always keep in mind and what I like to stress uh, when engaging in conversations like this is if you're trying to activate uh, a skills-based talent marketplace, it's that's both a human problem and a technology problem. It's both and. Um, and it's so easy to try to solve one without the other. Um, but 
what we have learned uh, in our talent supply chain work as, as we've been organizing hundreds of employer collaboratives, thousands of, of employers across 38 states and Canada, is you really need to, to, to support the culture change uh, inside companies and across industries for them to think through how they could best design jobs uh, and articulate uh, and improve the hiring requirements to be more skill-based, to facilitate skill-based hiring. But the first step is getting them to design a better job um, and to design it around uh, in-demand skills. And there's a lot of work that needs to happen there because absent that, you know, there, there's a lot of data out there, but it's bad data in, bad data out. So we need to clean things up on the inside if we're gonna have a, a truly skill-based talent marketplace. And that takes employers uh, changing their jobs at their core, refining and improving them and making them more skill-based. But then that unto itself is not enough because then it requires them to be able to signal out um, those skills to all the uh, important stakeholders that want that information, whether it's a job seeker, whether it's a, a learner um, who's who's trying to explore career options or trying to assess what their knowledge, skills, and abilities are, are potentially a fit for, uh, whether it's a, uh, a career guidance counselor, a workforce board director, uh, someone um, in a post-secondary institution designing curriculum, who all these people want to know what's inside of an in-demand job and what are the in-demand skills so I can either uh, assess my fit for it, I know how to build a, a pathway to attain it, uh, or I know how to design a credential or an assessment to speak to those skills or to demonstrate um, that, that somebody who's gone through this pathway or earned this credential or taken this assessment um, has the requisite skill for that job. But it takes them cleaning it up, but then employers need to structure those skills uh, inside their, their HR systems. So it's not just static flat data, but they're sending out dynamic uh, uh, machine actionable data about in-demand skills and jobs. And we're using technology to facilitate the, the sharing of that good structured data to all of the necessary stakeholders who need access to it. Um, so we have been working hard to, to support that workflow process that companies need to go through to design their job descriptions better, but then to provide them with the data standards and other resources to be able to create structured data on in-demand skills and jobs for sharing. Uh, and then even then we're not done because you need to look through, uh, look at the process for how somebody is then able to reflect uh, what they know aren't able to do as structured skills data as part of their record. Uh, whether you call it a transcript, a, a credential, a resume, or portfolio, these learning and employment records that individuals have need to be structured dynamic data that can equally be shared to not only government entities to determine uh, what they may be eligible for as far as programs, to share it with post-secondary institutions uh, to be assessed for prior learning credit uh, or to be admitted into a program, but ultimately to share with employers uh, to be able to attest that they have the skills, competencies, and credentials uh, to fit with that job opportunity. Um, and that we, we need structured data about skills on all sides of the ecosystem if we're going to achieve this vision. So everybody plays a role, uh, but in order to facilitate the sharing of that skills data like currency that is transactionable, but also translatable, it requires a data infrastructure to support it, but also the change management that's a human problem. So we're not just building tools that, that are in search of customers or a build it and they will come approach, but we need to make sure that the, the technology, the data standards and the skills are addressing the highest priority use cases for each of the core stakeholders in this ecosystem, because these are at the end of the day, they're tools to facilitate a process like applying for a job, uh, pursuing upskilling and career advancement, applying uh, for, for a continuing education program. We have to fit it in the right context, which is the use case, and we need to make sure uh, we're aligning incentives across those stakeholders. But we, 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 you know, we can build the technology and we're doing that, and that's important. It's a huge infrastructure need, but we also need the human infrastructure piece of this. And we need to support change management on all sides, learners, educators, and employers, so we know how to make use of these new tools and and these skills to address our most critical use cases and workflow processes. So happy to be here, Andrew, and uh, thank you for allowing me to be part of this discussion. Jason, I think you've been at this a while. Thank you for um, really laying out the, the waterfront of issues. Really love the framing around the human problem, the technology problem, and I know we'll be able to dig into that. Debbie, um, catch us up on Marco and uh, any else you'd want to spotlight as part of a just orientation. Sure. And thank you again to everyone and to the Open Skills Network and to the panelists. I'm so excited and honored to be part of this. Um, as Andrew alluded to, this is a passion 
of uh, mine. And so I'm just excited to bring the employer perspective, but also uh, we'll start a little bit with what Markle has been doing uh, in this space uh, so that we can think about how we all help uh, workers leverage their skills and drive to a more inclusive economy. The Markle Foundation has been working with a broad coalition of partners for the last eight years on workforce and skill issues, uh, getting a little bit to what Jason just said with that, uh, the technology and the coalition. Our theory of change is that if we move our country's labor market to be rooted in skills versus proxies of one's abilities, such as degrees, more workers will have access to opportunity regardless of where and how they acquire those skills. And so to respond to the employment crisis triggered by the pandemic and to scale the impact of our workforce initiatives, the Markle Foundation formed the Rework America Alliance, which is aimed at helping displaced workers return to good jobs by driving actions that expand opportunities for employment and broaden ways for all Americans to learn and train for the future of work. And in particular, those without a bachelor's degree, workers of color, and women so that they can access jobs that pay a living wage and which open up opportunities for future advancement. The collaborative effort draw, draws on the resources, expertise, and research and reach of such a diverse set of partners, which is really important. It's not possible. Our partners are uh, key stakeholders like the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, the National Urban League, Boeing, Goodwill, CVS Health, McKinsey, Walmart, uh, and many others. And the initiative has really brought together a unique and diverse set of organizations, including the AFL-CIO and SEIU's HCAP and the NAACP and other worker-serving organizations collaborating with large employers who do not traditionally see working together, uh, which speaks to the level of partnership and engagement and the national imperative around what the nation is facing today. So at Markle, we're focused on uh, helping workers and people without a bachelor's degree, um, uh, more recently working in low-wage jobs, uh, by looking at historical job transitions and how real people have been able to achieve and move up. Um, and this informs our work in everything we do. So we've been using these insights and actionable takeaways to build resources and tools so that uh, individuals, workers, coaches, employers can take action on them. And our four key elements of our approach are first, identifying the promising job progressions for workers to pursue um, and to help people to move into these promising jobs. We're identifying high quality training programs aligned to skills needed for these roles, uh, programs that are affordable, accessible, and effective at helping people to be successful in a new role. And as we know that making these choices are and going through these transitions are really hard, we're helping to improve the support available to workers by making these new resources available to the organizations and individuals that already provide support within communities. So we're developing and sharing digital tools to help career coaches and other support specialists better serve displaced workers. Um, but fundamentally, and why we're here today, we believe that we need employers to change the way they hire and to adopt a more equitable approach to how they source, hire, promote their workforce. And we're working with a coalition of, of employers to drive practice change and have developed tools and resources to help them take that action. Thank you, Debbie. We have such great perspective represented on our panel. So let's dig into some questions. Um, Sean, you mentioned the you know opportunity pillar, the commitment, um, five years, uh, and um, significant funding that that seems to grow by the day. But you know, you're as a funder of skills initiatives. Um, what, as you think, look back on the past year, year plus, you can uh, you know decide on the time frame. There's been a lot of activity, um, a lot of innovation. So what? Uh, are you most excited about whether it's been through uh, what you've been involved in or you've sort of witnessed? Yeah, you know, I, I think my first question would be how much time do we have? There's just, there is so much um, 
just so much excitement to be had in, in this space right now. Um, let me first kind of maybe speak to the potential and the excitement around the potential and, and maybe define one thing that I think is key uh, to think about on behalf of employers, but also to employers, and then maybe round out with some of the, the reality of where we're at um, that leaves us uh, lots of room for excitement. Um, but one of those first things that I think is important um, to define the excitement is that um, I, I think we're moving away from a world that that is somehow skills versus degrees or one system for some and another system for everyone else. Um, and really, as we think about these skills and, and is, you know, we should be thinking about this as skills as a language that is really spoken or in many cases, machine readable um, between all, all forms of learning and work. And, and this is, is something I think over the last year has really started to materialize. And so as we as we continue to move down this path and connect the dots like we're, we've been doing in a way that I, I think um, has just moved a whole lot faster in some ways, maybe because we're all working from home and, and thinking about it differently um, than we might have pre-pandemic. Um, and, and truly, what we're seeing is this working towards building um, this language um, of skills, or maybe it's multiple language with translators connecting it, um, that's really allowing for skills, especially those that are validated, to provide us a path for assuring that all learning can count. Now, I, you know, I think about that, what does that mean? Um, you know, that means we, we all learn differently in different places. I've had the privilege of working with with many that that didn't go down what you might call a traditional path, as well as those that went to some of the best schools in the world. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it's short sighted and unrealistic um, to think about that um, that we're going to meet our our demands around talent um, with some sort of one size fits all for learning. So building this skill system and and what we've seen over the last um, especially year, but really going back a number of years and what I think we'll see moving forward allows many of us um, to, to build out um, multiple different types of paths, on ramps, off ramps in your career um, that lead to upward mobility and really provide for a level of granularity in the data. Um, Marnie spoke to a little bit yesterday um, around that, that granularity of data um, that provides uh, endless potential really for this work si workforce system. And that's that's where I start to get real excited. I think that's where we all should be getting excited. Uh, this really is, is allowing us to be more focused on where learning is needed based on current and future skills um, that are required or even obtained um, and through these different mechanisms. Um, it's, it's really providing workers a clear understanding or it can, and this is what excites me, is it, it provides workers that clear understanding of how their skills translate to the current job market um, and provides a window into careers they may never have thought about uh, or and uh, thought about how their skills align with um, and provides them information they need to be prepared to, to think about that future work. Now, from a reality standpoint, you know, the recognition of the opportunity uh, of what skills can can do, like I started saying at the beginning, has really shot to the workforce charts, top of the workforce charts over the last year. Um, and so many are starting to move in the right direction, you know, from the 110 coalition to the work um, from an infrastructure standpoint around the U.S. Chamber and OSN to Business Roundtable to Markle. I could really just keep going. You're starting to see all of these, what I might have said were silos or some of us have heard in the past, kind of the wild, wild west of, of, of skills and, and LERs and other systems that enable it. And we're really starting to move into a more cohesive type of um, opportunity here moving forward. And so that's where, as not only looking back, but looking forward, there's just endless amounts of opportunity, no pun intended. So thank you. Sean, I think for the audience uh, on the 110 coalition, definitely picking up some some uh, attention and some great commitments. Do you want to just give a thumbnail just for people's awareness on uh, what 110 is? Yeah. So for those who don't know, 110 is the is the commitment to um, hire one one million um, black um, workers into family sustaining um, jobs 
um, and specifically focused on those that have not necessarily gone a traditional route, do not have degrees. Um, and I, what's exciting about their work is that they're working, I think to Jason's point earlier, they're working not only on the people side of this um, and the human factors that play into these decisions um, of how you make this work, um, but also um, focused on the technology enablements um, that really connects the dots between all of those partners that can that can make that system happen, especially as, as employers continue to grow and think about how they can leverage these tools um, to make sure they're building in equity across their systems um, and not just leaning on what we did five years ago or before. Thanks, Sean. And, you know, I think as you were laying out um, the opportunity and then some of the exciting initiatives, you see sort of work at the, the broad ecosystem level, even with employers. So I'm going to get to Jason next on that but also some focused work on different uh, communities of need, right? From 110 to Debbie, um, the work that uh, Markle is focused on with uh, low wage workers and, and um, focusing insights and then pathways were for them. So- Yeah, yeah I real, what I will say in that, I think that's where is we think about your original question on what is exciting over the last year, is a lot of that infrastructure work is now allowing these coalitions to actually put it into practice. That's what's the most exciting. It probably should have been my 10 second answer earlier. You got it, there's your 10 seconds. Um, well, I'll, I'll mix it up then and then I do wanna spend some good time just thinking about employer practice change and, and some of the things that Jason outlined. But since we're talking about um, different groups putting it into practice, Debbie, from Markle's perspective um, and the, the work that you're doing, um, how is the, are the practice change, but also the infrastructure uh, affected the focus of the Rework America Alliance? Uh, thanks, Andrew, and thanks, Sean. Um, I think your, your longer answer was actually uh, perfect. So, um, you know, skills-based practices, uh, probably not uncommon or uh, something new to this audience in particular, right? Um, has been the focus of Markle's uh, employer work for many years, right? Um, and we've seen from history that if you take a pedigree-based approach to talent, uh, it tends to lock the workers who we want to support, support most. Um, uh, them out of opportunities. Um, and so in the recovery, particularly given the systemic racial inequality that we all are aware of, um, we believe the business community has a, a moral and business imperative to rethink the approach to talent. Um, and so taking an inclusive skills-based approach to managing um, talent uh, shows both uh, improvement in diversity and helps acquire better talent to meet needs um, and will, will ultimately lead to better performance and better business results. Um, and in particular, it means rather than relying on education, credentials, and past experience, it means recognizing one's knowledge and abilities regardless of where they were acquired. Now, we've built tools and resources to be able to have employers take training to um, move to a more skills-based talent approach. And we've been partnering with our colleagues at the Business Roundtable and our colleagues um, with 110 and intermediaries across the country to support employer practice change uh, that allows for skills-based practices to become uh, to lead to more opportunity. I think what's really exciting about this conversation and uh, the infrastructure we're building um, around skills is that we can then apply it to good jobs. We now know what are the good jobs. We know who are the employers that have opportunities for those good jobs. We know who requires credentials and maybe could change their practices to focus more on skills. We know where there are what we would call origin roles that may not pay a living wage, um, but are in high demand 
we have opportunities to make those better jobs and give opportunity in this economy. And the way that we do that at scale is by taking a, uh, a system uh, and making it interoperable. And so for us, the, this all becomes very real with employers by taking all those skills-based practices and the training and the steps to a more diverse and inclusive economy and applying it to real jobs and real workers. And the way that we do that, we think, is through um, uh, interoperable skills and the infrastructure that we're talking about. Yes. All right. Let's get into this infrastructure conversation. And, um, you know, those of you who've been following the, the legislation at the federal level, isn't it, you know, those of us who've been in this space for years, uh, amazing that we're finally thinking about talent and workforce and the opportunity to not only have a more skilled workforce, but one that is is um, mobile and engaged in, in good jobs as, as part of the infrastructure for our country and our competitiveness. Um, Jason, one of the conversations we were having earlier um, in the week uh, was really about um, is we think about the employer and the infrastructure um, and the chambers in this very unique place as both um, uh, representing the largest employers, but also small and, and medium sized companies across the country. Um, the value proposition um, this is something that many of us were, were, who, uh, who were sort of started over here. Um, we know we need to do this work. We need to understand um, and start building the foundation. And the translation into the day-to-day -day of operating a business and, and hiring people um, and all the associated uh, systems change and practice change is, is clearly an ongoing journey. But, you know, how do you think about... Um, the employer workflow process, where can open skills be used um, to address employer needs? How do we make that case? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. I think there, there's a number of different use cases that could be addressed for employers through the use of skills. Um, approaching them as, as like a monolithic, th monolithic thing is, isn't gonna get you very far, but talking about how skills can be uh, tactically applied as a tool to help facilitate a workflow process that activates different value propositions depending on what you're trying to do, that's the way to do it. So I could come in and talk about how skills and, and an open skills data infrastructure could be used to better design and articulate what's inside of a job. Um, I could use that those same tools to then promote curriculum uh, uh, mapping. Um, so we can actually begin tagging skills to learning outcomes and actually build the, the tools that facilitates that. We could talk about how you could use structured skills data in a record um, to do better uh, matching towards the most in-demand jobs that are available through an employer or an employer collaborative. But as you start thinking about, you know, what's the means to the end? I mean, it, it's a means to an end, but what's that end? Well, at the end of the day, to address that value proposition and to get large scale buy-in uh, from employers and to make this mainstream, it's going to have to address uh, some of their key uh, ROI characteristics that they're looking for, such as by using these skills, does it in fact help um, reduce time to hire uh, for vacancies that I have? Does it actually improve the, the qualifications uh, of the job candidates who are applying for the job? Uh, does it uh, actually improve the match rate um, in such a way that it reduces onboarding and training costs? Uh, can I actually uh, use this to find uh, individuals who are a better fit that are more likely to be retained uh, over time? Can I use this to facilitate my reskilling or upskilling efforts to move people into critical job roles um, that I need filled that I could fill internally as opposed to um, uh, going to the external market? Um, and the list goes on, and including DEI objectives. You know, are skills actually helping me? diversify my workforce uh, and improve the diversity of hires? Or is it, can I see evidence that is it, it, by using them, it has expanded um, the pool of talent that I am sourcing from? So you always got to get to that end game. What's it all about? And then skills are nothing but a tool for how you get there. Um, so that's how we need to be engaging the employers. But in all of those various instances, it's going to take peer-to-peer -peer learning and practice. That's how we learn best, or at least my experience with our chamber community and our members, where we're engaging in like talent supply chain management, is it's all about us learning together and getting better together and sharing best practices. You know, it's one thing to, to, to have somebody try to try to convince you that this is the right thing to do or the right way to go or for 
uh, or for government to take a position on it and suggest this is kind of the future. But it's another thing to say, well, where are my processes are relative to the peers I know and trust and respect or compete with? And how am I always keeping an eye on where am I relative to everyone else's practices and how am I always keeping up or getting better or how are we learning together? And it's that peer to peer learning um, that needs to happen in the private sector. And it's often the hardest thing to do. But if we're going to kind of build this this culture change, if we're going to support these system changes, we have to get to the key ROI characteristics and explain this is how the skills, data and infrastructure fits into your workflow process that's going to unlock your value proposition. That's a conversation, but then it's not just the the, uh, the connecting the dots. It's then going in saying, well, we're gonna show you how to do it. Um, and then we're gonna kind of build a community of practice where we're all learning together and improving together as peers. Um, that's how we've been approaching it. Now, the, the challenge with that is it's the long game. You know, this takes, uh, it's a big country. We have over 1,500 chambers, over 3 million firms that make up the chambers network, um, and that's not even all of them. So it's gonna take, uh, a, a, it's gonna take commitment and persistence. Uh, and what we can't do uh, is rely on boutique solutions. Uh, we need to make sure that we are, uh, when we're in this space and we're talking about the issues we're talking about, we always have to have an eye towards scale and where are the opportunities to scale quickly and effectively and in a persistent way? Because this kind of change management, this is the long game. It's gonna take time. There's no easy button, there's no quick wins. Uh, but a lot of folks have been doing this for a long time uh, and we need a lot more folks doing it. So this is a great group to hang out with because uh, these are the folks who are serious uh, about actually creating and facilitating this change uh, and to do it in the right way. Because always keep in mind, um, just because we want to move towards a skills-based marketplace, that does not unto itself mean we're moving towards a more equitable marketplace. These are a means to an end, uh, unless you're hyper-intentional uh, and considerate of how this infrastructure is being applied, it could just as easily exacerbate an equity as it can facilitate equity. So we always need to be mindful and have those equity considerations and ethical considerations as part of our conversations. Because just because you do it doesn't mean you should. And just because you do it and you are well intended, it doesn't mean it's going to play out um, the way you thought it might. So we just got to be hypersensitive to that at every step of the, uh, the way. But the, the good thing is OSN and, and other networks like it are really bring in very serious players to the table who are having the right conversations who, and who I think are, are the folks who will be persistent uh, and will help facilitate uh, that long game. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, I, I think um, OSN, or e I mean, each of you represent um, a really important shift from uh, what were fragmented but excellent work, but starting to, to come together in meaningful ways. And I think, um, yes, there's experimentation and, and practice and muscle building we're all doing in each, but even within each, the opportunity for scale, right, is are, are already present. And clearly we're not always gonna have one all connected system, but if we're hitting the, the key communities um, and, and driving change also at that sort of system level, um, we're going to get to a lot of the, the progress we hope to achieve. Um, Kelly, do we have some questions from the audience? Want to make sure we get them in. Definitely, Andrew. This chat is just as on fire as this panel, by the way. So we have some fantastic questions. The uh, um, first question is actually for Sean. This comes from Jeff Johnson. What was the time frame for Walmart to start the engagement of skills in their workplace to where it is integrated into all aspects? Um, he points out, pilots, groups, entire org, et cetera. Yeah, you know, um, so of course I, I sit in the philanthropic arm and spend most of my time focused on kind of the external systems, but um, with the way we're set up, I also spend a lot of time engaging with the, the business. And I can tell you um, that's not a simple answer and that this has been an ongoing process for a while um, and will be an ongoing part of our work moving forward. Um, you know, we've got a number of initiatives that all are connecting the dots around skills, um, not only thinking about from a hiring perspective and engagement on project or coalitions um, like Rework and 110 and all of these efforts, but also thinking about how does that operationalize within the business from badging of learning um, to building out job descriptions that understand what competencies or more importantly, what proficiency levels 
are required for um, those roles and within um, role job families. Um, so there's there's a myriad of programs that are happening. And I would say a lot of what we're doing now is, is really assuring that those are in alignment um, with a shared strategy across the company and, and that work is ongoing um, today. Um, but I, I, the one piece I'll throw in here is that interoperability is the key word in anything we're talking about, whether we're thinking about it internally to the company or externally um, from a philanthropic element, interoperability. If you're not focused on interoperability, you're not doing it right. Um, so um, I, I hopefully that, that somewhat gets into it without uh, spending the rest of the time talking about every one of our initiatives. Super helpful, Sean. Thank you. We have another quick question from Callie Morrison. We couldn't figure that out this answer in the chat, but she asks, does anyone know if the Trump era executive order for skills-based hiring federally survived the transition to the new administration? My understanding is it did. From last last I heard, it, it is ongoing. Yeah, that, that's my understanding as well. Yeah. The conversation is alive and well. Perfect. Okay. And we've got another question here from Rupert Ward. A useful development within employment would be some key performance metrics that all employers and employees could understand. Does anyone have any suggestions on things they would like clearer performance measures on? Yeah, I, I, I spoke a little bit to the employer metrics that we're looking for, but I think what's uh, more intriguing um, in terms of use of our time is thinking through, you know, what are the, the highest priority use cases and associated performance metrics for learners and workers themselves? And I think we're making a lot of assumptions about what those may be, um, but I don't think we've really fully scratched the surface to, to find out what is the core value proposition for the learner and worker, because there are lots of use cases that can be explored in, in our T3 network when we started um, our work with learning and employment records, uh, which make use of skills. You know, we, we articulated like five high priority use cases of which some were learner facing, but there's a lot out there. And I think that's where the, you know, you're gonna get real market uptake is when we get those consumers, the learners and workers making use of and transacting these skills in ways that address their core needs. Uh, but I think we're we're making a lot of really good assumptions and some folks are doing some really good research and Sean's actually backing a lot of that research now. But I think there there is a, a great deal more to learn about, you know, what are the metrics that are most important to learners and workers themselves? I could tell you from the employer side what's what's resonating, but I, I think we that's where we, we have a gap and we need to know more. Yeah, and I'll just jump in. I, I would just say that uh, creating a culture of inclusivity does not stop at the higher, right? So a lot of we can you can have employers change their practices, and then you can source, uh, interview, and and hire um, a worker based on on skills. And if you don't create a holistic approach um, and a culture surrounded, uh, that worker will most likely uh, not stay. So thinking about the performance indicators and the and the term interoperable. Um, or integrated through the through an individual's career as they move from employer to employer, um, entering into one employer and having them be prepared with skills-based practices is a place and it's important. But having that translate and move with a worker along, so thinking about the indicators for success for those workers as they progress through their career, I think is a really important research space that needs to be expanded upon. I do think there's one metric, um, you know, it's still an evolving space that's meaningful to the learner worker and to the employer, which is engagement, right? Um, as we think about good jobs, um, that combination of, of course, uh, economically meaningful, but purpose and, you know, good culture to, to Debbie's point. Um, but uh, yeah, add it to, to the list. And I, I see that certainly growing as a focus area. Um, Kelly, do we have one more question or do, should we um, move to close? You know what, do you mind, if we have time, let's grab, we have two questions, but I can narrow that down to one. <laughs> so- All right, let's stick with Nicole. one and then we'll- <laughs> Yeah, we can. So from Nicole, I've heard much about skills-based learning for job 
jobs and a skills-based marketplace. I'd like to hear from the panelists how this translates to the next level careers. I, I can jump in first. I mean, I, I think there, there's all of those kind of comments or, or sayings out there, lifelong learning, all learning counts. I used that earlier, career pathways, all of those kind of terms that are out there. I think when we think about skills, this is allowing us to realize that in a way that we have not really truly been able to do today, right? And, and one of the things I think is you look at some of the career pathway tools that are being developed, especially those that are using val or at least building towards um, validated um, skills. So not just kind of the generic data that's out there, but really truly what skills do you have is it gives you that glimpse on how do your skills overlap with jobs today? How does it overlap with jobs that um, you may not have thought of, um, as well as what are those jobs that are in high demand that your skills are, are lacking? And so that's where it's that understanding of, OK, I can now go get this micro credential or a degree, whatever is required to kind of get to that next level. And, and that's the key. I think that's going to be important as we move forward and think about how skills translate to uh, moving upward in your career. Yeah, I, I just second what Sean is saying. It's if you know, it, it's one thing to talk about you know skills as they're represented in a credential versus an assessment versus a record. Um, but where you know the chamber's been spending a lot of its time is the 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 articulation or reflection of skills in the context of a job, which is an abstract thing. Um, so how are we describing the job description or posting as structured skills data? And if we're able to do that, and we got some pretty cool ideas for how to do that at scale. Um, and so we're getting close, but as we're as we're building that out, if we're able to get a critical mass of jobs that are part of careers, um, and we can actually map the skills and then semantically map how they're similar or different, we can start identifying better career pathway trajectories for individuals. And we can also then help companies be more intentional about creating those upskilling opportunities within their companies. Um, but we need that data, and that data is currently a hot mess. Um, it's, it's unstructured, messy data. But if we create structured, high quality skills data, we will begin to understand the relationship of things in a much more intentional way. So folks can identify pathways that might not have been obvious or clear. Um, and that, that, that not only works for, for the individual who's trying to, to navigate their career pathway, over time, but also for companies who are trying to think through all the different entry and exit points on and off ramps for their jobs and careers and how they're able to better organize pathways internally as opposed to hiring people, losing them, and then trying to hire them externally again. So I, I think if we get this right, if it puts in place a fundamental piece of the infrastructure to actually uh, facilitate high quality, high quality and intentional upskilling and to do it at scale, uh, which currently we're just not there yet. And I'll just close because uh, in 10 seconds to just say it's exactly that. It's taking intention to action. You see the commitments. You see the employers wanting to use skills-based practices to diversify their workers, to be able to close their talent gaps and use this. But this it, that is not an easy thing without having this intentionality and interoperability. And so it really sums up to being able to take the intentions and bring them to action um, and I think we're still at a place where this community and bringing together employers um, can learn and build that action and infrastructure together, um, which is why it's so exciting uh, to be at the forefront of it. But it really is watching good intentions be able to translate into action. Wow. Um Sean, Jason, Debbie, you did my job for me in terms of the closing. I think you really hit on um, where we are, but also the opportunity ahead. And uh, very grateful to have you join the, the panel today, give um, the audience a window into um, employer practice change and engagement in the skills-based marketplace, but really um, sort of the, the collective vision and, and roadmap for the future. Thank you for being with us, but also thank you for the work that you are each doing um, within your organizations. Uh, we'll hand it over to Kelly. Thank you guys as well. This was a fantastic start to what is about to, we are about to move to, which is these interactive breakout sessions. Because all I can say is that the discussion we've had here has got 
like I said, this chat going with all of this, this wonderful feedback, all of these wonderful suggestions. As you guys just closed out, the idea of moving to action is such a big point to this. I absolutely love that. And that is where we are headed next. So um, I wanted to quickly give you a little bit of information on what to expect in terms of the breakouts. So we've got a slide up on the screen there. We're going to have five concurrent breakout rooms going on at the same time. Again, like I said, these are interactive. We're going to group problem solve all together. We need all of those comments that you're making there, all of that insight, all of your out of the box thinking, and we need you to bring those into these discussions. In room one, we are going to focus on what does talent, meaning the learner earner or the person navigating, need to have an understanding of regarding skills and its application to themselves. That's going to be moderated by Jason Jones. In room two, we're going to cover what do you need to be active activated or enabled to help you adopt open skills. Rupert Ward is kindly moderating that room. In room three, we're going to talk about what does collaboration around open skills mean to you? Where does collaboration need to be refined or enhanced? That will be moderated by Naomi Bohr. Um, and then we've got, oh, two more rooms. Room four, what do policymakers need or need to champion or need to do to achieve Champion Adoption of Open Skills, moderated by Michael J. And lastly, room five, what on the open skills horizon that we need to be, what is on the open skills horizon that we need to be prepared for, moderated by Suzanne Cabanaro. So again, we want you to keep in mind as you head into these sessions, we want you to think beyond the constructs of higher education. Learning can happen as anywhere, um, as Sean mentioned. Consider impact and needs at all levels. We don't want to only consider people with degrees as that conversation just happened as well. And remember that panel yesterday, our work does not have borders. We need to incorporate a global perspective when we come into these conversations. After you head over there and you do all that great work, we're going to come right back here to this general session so that we can share our learnings with the entire group and then learn from each of those as well, which is always fantastic. The way you're going to access these breakout rooms is a little different from yesterday. So if you can just pay one quick attention here to what's on your screen, you're going to go back to the lobby, to the breakout area. You're going to click on more info. And from there, you're going to get a Teams link because we want you to be able to come I'm off of mute so you can join on on these discussions. So those are going to be the team links, excuse me, teams link that you join in. Before you leave here and go over there, I just want to remind you guys, um, don't forget, we need you to stay active in the chat. We need you to share on social with the hashtag OSN Summit. All right. So you guys head over to that lobby, get in there, and I will see you soon.